And the next three speakers are early stage investigators from various units here across Duke University who have received funding from the CIFAR for their work. Moderating this session is Keith Reeves, who's the director of the CIFAR Developmental Corps. And so Keith, thank you for your, um, introducing, and we'll proceed with Charlie. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's really a great pleasure uh, for me to, to introduce the speakers and, and moderate the, the next session because uh, among its, its many other activities, uh, one of the, the great things uh, in the CIFAR Developmental Corps is, is soliciting and reviewing uh, and issuing uh, different kinds of, of award to support uh, early stage investigators. Uh, so I'll go ahead and, and introduce uh, our, our first speaker, uh, who I think uh, Charlie Burns has been sort of a, a superstar for the CIFAR Developmental Corps, uh, receiving uh, faculty development, pilot, micro grant, uh, and CIFAR uh, supplemental uh, awards. Uh, so Charlie's currently an assistant professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases here at Duke. Clinically, he's interested in general infectious diseases, especially HIV, uh, and also medical education. His research interests include HIV prevention and health services research, uh, with a focus on novel access points to HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis, and particularly re-engagements, uh, re-engagement of persons with HIV uh, into clinical care, and that's, I believe, what he's going to talk to us today about. Charlie, thanks very much. Hey everyone, um, thank you so much for that nice introduction. I'm Charlie. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you all about this project that we've been doing over the past couple years, and we'll get through as much as we can in the short time. But we're going to talk about building a reengagement network for out of care persons with HIV at Duke and our plans to expand that beyond. So, this is really important for us at Duke and here in the South, because as many of us here probably are aware, um, the South is the area in the United States with the most HIV diagnoses per region. Um, so here the quote, the nice quote from the, from the CDC and uh, AIDS view is that the South comprised 38% of the US population, but represented over half of new HIV diagnoses. And for 2020, that was over 15,000 diagnoses. And so that begs the question of where are all these new infections coming from? And so these data are from a CDC medical morbid morbidity mortality weekly report. And so what they did is they took all the data that gets reported to the CDC about uh, new diagnoses and um, the tracking from them, and they put into a computer model to determine or predict, you know, where, where are these new diagnoses coming from? And what surprised us is that the majority, so about 60-ish percent if you do the math, are actually coming from persons who are aware of their HIV diagnosis but are either not in care, so that's the 42.6 percent, or not virally suppressed, which is the 19.8 percent. So if you think about that, you would predict that these are patients who have fallen out of care at some point, because if they are aware of their HIV diagnosis, then presumably they've had contact with the healthcare system at some point, um, but now are either didn't follow through with that if they're not in care, or not following through consistently if they're, virally, if they're not virally suppressed. And so looking at this a little bit further through what we call the HIV care continuum, which is a range from being diagnosed to being linked to care, which is again having a, a set appointments, receiving care, which is defined as having a CD4 viral load test within 30 days, retaining care, which is, um, I believe the CDC refers that to having a second CD4 viral load test within three months, and then again virally, viral suppression. So if we look at this with the United States in the blue and North Carolina in the red, we're, we're doing pretty good at, at making HIV diagnoses and getting those persons linked to care. But as you move further down the care continuum, people start to drop and off. And, and what I want to call to your attention is that we really have room to improve with retention and care. Um, the United States as a whole, it's only about 50%. Here in North Carolina, we are doing better. Um, but again, we're only at 72%. And if you're curious about what we're, where we're trying to get to, the goal is what we call 90-90-90. That's through UNAID, the UNAIDS Foundation um, organization. And their goal was... Uh, 90% of persons living with HIV know their diagnosis. Of those, 90% of them are receiving care, and of those, 90% are virally suppressed. So, so as you can see, we've, we've really got some room to, to move on this. But the question becomes, you know, how are we, how are we actually going to achieve these goals? And uh, the United States has the federal ending the HIV, HIV epidemic, and they give us four pillars to work with. Um, of those four pillars, the first is to diagnose all persons with HIV as early as possible. I think we're doing a pretty good job with that. The second is treating people with HIV rapidly and effectively to reach viral suppression. 
the third is preventing new HIV transmissions using proven interventions such as PrEP and responding. The fourth is finally responding to HIV outbreaks. And so again, I think if we focus on retention and care and making sure people with a living with HIV are on life-saving antiretroviral therapy, I think we're actually targeting two of these pillars. So again, for the person with HIV, if you, if you give them life-saving treatment, you're, pre you're preventing morbidity and mortality that goes along with the disease. But you're also preventing new transmissions through what we know now with uh, undetectable equals untransmittable or U equals U. So if your viral load is suppressed, you can no longer transmit the virus through sex. So we're actually targeting two, two of the four pillars. So this begs the question of, you know, there are people who are already doing this at the state level, and how are, how are they doing? And so North Carolina does have uh, bridge counselors whose job is to try to find these persons who are out of care and get them back in with, a, with their provider, but it's a big task to ask to cover the whole state. Uh, these are the most recent, at least to my knowledge, most recent outcomes uh, from 2020, and at that point there was over 2,500 persons living with HIV not receiving care. And of those, the state counselors were only able to link about 27% back into care. Uh, the rest of them were either unable to locate, noted to be out of state, refused follow-up, or had some sort of other issue where they were incarcerated, missing data, or, had, or deceased. They also know there's a lot of uh, obstacles to re-engagement, which is probably not surprising to most of us here in this room. That include financial barriers, transportation, you know, get, taking time off work, getting to the appointment. You know, have other concerns such as housing may be more pressing, and then just frank distrust of the medical or surveillance system. And so with that in mind, we thought, how can we partner with North Carolina and, and aid them in these efforts? So again, the Duke Health System is fairly large. It has a large catchment area that includes one of the most populous regions of North Carolina. And so can we use our healthcare system to act as a safety net to partner to complement what the state and local health departments are already doing across the whole breadth of the care continuum from preventing HIV to linking persons into care and then what we're sp focusing on here is re-engagement of out-of-care patients. But we also didn't want to have the same obstacles that the state ran into and so we wanted to think about this a little bit more and so you know for the financial transportation and housing concerns that the state faced we thought well when we approach patients, let's link them right away with our clinical social workers and resource coordinators so that we can make sure that, you know, maybe, maybe HIV is not the most pressing thing for them right now at this moment. So let's make sure we address them as a whole and make sure we take care of what their pressing issues are to help them get back into care. And we know that a lot of persons have co-occurring co disease with mental health and substance use. And so again, at that time, we, we would do a, a mental health and substance use screener and get persons whatever care it is that they need or that they're willing to have. Uh, the second portion is we wanted to focus on, um, or the second issue would be missing or out-of-state persons. So we said let's focus on persons at the emergency department. Uh, that gives us kind of two things. One, we know the person's in our area at least. Two, we're hoping that, that at some point they upgraded de updated demographics so we have an updated phone number or an address for them. And then the question is maybe they're more receptive to establishing care. So something happened that made that person seek out medical attention. So maybe at that point it's a good time to reapproach them and say, hey, we're, we're here for you. How can we help? And then as far as distrust of the medical surveillance system, we wanted, at least for now, patients who are established in our clinics so that with a person calling them, we're, there's a face to a name, they know who we are. We're not just a random person calling them, asking them what's up, and hopefully that'll be more encouraging to get them back in to see us. So with that, we thought our inclusion population was gonna be adults um, known to be living with HIV, established in our clinics so at least one prior visit, um, coming to an ED and then we defined out of, out of care as no clinic, or no clinic visit for a year. Um, and that's based off of guidelines recommending every six month follow-up for, for viral loads at least. Um, our exclusion then were people who had upcoming clinic appointments. So if you come to the ED and you, you're exactly one year out and you have an appointment coming up in a week, we're, you're fine. We're not, we're not worried about you. Um, repeat ED visits, a lot of times patients come to the ED multiple times. So if we've contacted you or you know, assessed you and you've come back you know, 20 times before or your visit, that didn't count. Um, if they're established with an outside provider, so if we could see that easily in the chart through care everywhere, or again, if somebody's coming in through chart review and they're coming in with, for instance, like a heart attack, that's, that's not the time for us to come, to come and ask them about their, their follow-up visit. And our goal is uh, return to care, which we describe or define as just attending a visit with an HIV provider. Again, this is a real-time um, project, so, so we also say, you know, if you're agreeable to coming to a visit, that is, that's a win until you don't show. <laughs> if you don't show up, that's considered a failure, and, and then you're eligible to try again if alerts repeated. So with that in mind, this is what the, the project act, program actually looks like. We call it HCRT, which is the HIV Re Reengagement Rapid Response Team. It was launched in 
October of 2020. And it utilize, utilizes the discern system. So um, for those of you not familiar with it, that's an internal thing here at Duke. It's used for research. So for instance, like if you were doing cancer research, you could tell them, hey, let, let you know, tell the computer, let me know anytime somebody comes in with this particular cancer so you can get an alert and, and ask them about, about chemotherapy. But in this situation, it automatically updates um, a list of persons who are out of care from Clinic 1K. It's uploaded into this computer system on the back end. And in real time, it just monitors the computer, the, the health network, so that if any patient with HIV who's from Clinic 1K, our clinic here at Duke, hasn't been seen in a year and goes to any Duke emergency department, then alert is activated. And that alert is a physical page. Um, at one point, we were going to do this in person, but then COVID happened. Um, but we also have an email alert that goes out. Um, and once we get that alert, our goal is that within 72 hours, we check the chart to make sure you, you reach eligibility. And if you do, we'll give you a call and offer re-engagement with, with our clinic. If uh, someone declines, good, we'll, we'll take note of that and we'll let them know, you know other places they can go or see how we can help them in other ways. And if they accept, then what we do is we get them a real-time appointment with a clinic social worker, usually same day or next day. Um, and then from there, the clinic social worker does our usual intake, really assess social, fat, social barriers, uh, mental health, substance use, and then get them linked in with their clinician. And so we've been highly successful. So uh, again, this has been live since October of 2020. Um, we've had 81 persons eligible for contact. So, um, of those 81, six have transferred care, 17 were unable to contact and due, two declined. 56 had clinic appointments scheduled. Of those, 10 did, not, uh, 10 did not show up and then the rest either completed their visit or have seven upcoming appointments. You'll note this, this number is a little bit low, the 81 overall, but again, this is just a, a low effort pilot project just at the Duke emergency departments. But it's cool because if you look at all the patients eligible for contact, 57% of them actually came to their appointment or have a scheduled visit. If you, if you narrow that down to just people who agreed to actually have an appointment scheduled, that goes up to 70%. Or if you're really hopeful that the seven who have upcoming appointments attend, that's 82. And we're also being a little bit conservative because I, I consider the six who transferred care as a, as a negative for this analysis. But um, realistically, I think that's a win too because we know those patients are actually not out of care. They're, they are getting care some, somewhere else. As far as the demographics of these individuals go, it's a wide age range with a mean of 47. I'll tell you it's mostly on the older side. Um, mostly men, mostly black, but also interestingly, a wide variety of different insurance statuses um, from private, Medicare, Medicaid, and none. So the key thing here is that we're really successful and it's really low cost and low effort. It's really just one person, it's passive. There's no active thing for you to do. You just sit and wait for that pager to go off and give them a call. And the startup costs are incredibly low. It was about 200 bucks to, to just get this pager up and running. And so since it's successful, we do want to look at expanding H3RT. And so what I didn't tell you is that there were 428 total alerts, even though only 81 were eligible. The majority of these were repeat visits, but a lot of patients were actually from surrounding healthcare centers. So people getting care at Lincoln Community Health, which is the majority, which is why it's bold, but also, you know, UNC, private providers in the practice. So our thought was, can we expand this to you know, other communities and other practices in our, in our area? And also the median age is 47, which surprised me because most, I would think there'd be maybe more younger people, just anecdotally from what I see in clinic. But there is consumer research showing that, again, um, younger individuals tend to prefer their care at urgent cares rather than traditional healthcare settings. So we thought, is that another place we can expand to? And so some of the things we want this to look at is, we want to have this at Duke, we want to partner with regional health centers, uh, we want to partner with maybe expanding this to urgent cares. Um, the other one is direct hospital admissions. So patients who are coming to the hospital who are bypassing the ED, the, the, they're not triggered by our pager. But ultimately, expanding this to all persons with HIV, whether it's patients from our clinic, expanding it to kids, expanding it to you know, um, patients from all our, in our whole area. And just to let you all know, the urgent care, we did actually do that. That went live as of uh, a, couple minute, or a couple weeks ago. Um, so that's going strong. And then the regional health centers is part of a CIFAR pilot grant. And what we're trying to do as part of that pilot grant is make sure persons with HIV think this is feasible and acceptable. We're not invading anybody's privacy. It's adding value to their care and, and people are, are enjoying it or have any sort of comments on how it should work. But we're also talking to providers to make sure this is acceptable. Would they be willing to use it? Is there privacy concerns? How would this work and how should this look if we expanded this to other, other practices in our area? And finally, are we improving outcomes? Like, are we actually having patients attend more long-term follow-up visits? How many of them are getting violently suppressed, having their CD4s come back? And if not, then why not?
So a lot of people to thank who have been all part of this project. I, I may have missed some people and I didn't mean to in person. So that's everyone. And then last but not least, if anybody wants to talk to more, happy to answer, send me some emails. Um, I'll be on service a little bit later today, so I'm going to sneak out here so you won't find me. But send me an email. I'm happy to talk more. Great. Thanks very much, Charlie. I think we have time for a couple of questions. So maybe I can I can just ask one to start. So, oh, I'm sorry, I missed somebody. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, my first question is: um, Do is there any program or any data to support um, non-progressors? Um, and if so, um, what? Is there data also to support that um, you all are starting, um, the healthcare profession is starting non progressives on medication? Yeah, so right now, at least for this project here, um, it's anybody who has a, a diagnosis of HIV within our health system is eligible to get reengaged. But then, as far as what happens after that, for someone who's like a chronic long term non progressor, it would be a conversation between that particular patient and their provider about what's, what's best for them in terms of their particular health care. So they would be involved in this too. If they, if they had seen us and were considered out of care, we would at least give them a call to see if we can get them back in to talk, talk with us. Great. Any other questions? I think. Michael. So this may be a little bit naive, but it, can you assume that if somebody is out of care for a year or more that they are like no longer virally suppressed? Or can you like renew their medication through like my chart and something? Like yeah, so great question. Not necessarily. So some, some persons are still in care, meaning that they're, I mean, they're still taking their medicines or have gotten refills from their provider. But, you know, again, guidelines would say you, every six months we should at least have a fault to check in to make sure everything's going okay. So it's a, it's a good mix. Some people are out of care, as we would think, like off medication, not, not engaging in care. Other people have just not shown up for a couple years and, and are like, oh, whoops, yeah, I didn't realize it's been two and a half years. So we're not discriminatory towards either one. It's anybody who, who satisfies those criteria. Great. I think we have time for, do we have time for one more? Yeah. One more. Thank you, Charlie. This work is awesome. So, and I appreciate all you're doing for our clinic population. So one question I have, because you know, this is a little bit of AI here where it's this automated procedure to bring patients back into care. Have you seen any people, um, patients that are slipping through the cracks that aren't being caught by this procedure you're doing? Because I think I know one that we've actually discussed. I never found out what happened. And then similarly, are you getting patients that actually, well, I guess someone already asked that question. They're in care. It's just that they haven't been seen in a year. Have you seen a number of those patients too where they're being captured by your H3RT but shouldn't be in there? Yeah, so, so to ask the first question, um, yeah, anecdotally, there are patients who slip through, um, and I don't, I don't know why. I, I just chalk it up to it is a computer system, so it's not going to be perfect. So I've had a few where providers have emailed me like, hey, did, did this get triggered by your alert? And the answer is no, and I sent it to the, the, the programmers, and they just kind of said, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so it's not, it's not perfect, uh, so that, you know, but I think nothing with a computer is. And then uh, the second question was, yeah, with some patients we would call, and they'd be in care, and they wouldn't, I mean, in care in terms of, on, on medications virally suppressed, but you know, whenever we contact the patient, we just basically come come kind of vaguely and just say, "Hey, we haven't seen you for over a year. Is everything okay? We'd like to just check in to make sure everything's all right." And everybody's very receptive to that. And I know with your question about AI, there's been a lot of talk in the in the general public about how does the people feel about AI in terms of their healthcare. And uh, we are doing those interviews with with people who've been contacted by H3RT, and I'll tell you, unscientifically, but just from listening to the interviews, people really like it. They, they feel cared for, they actually like that it's their, their clinic, their provider who's reaching out to them, so they feel like, they like that we're worried about them and, care, and are interested in their care. So it's been received positively so far, but I, I guess I can't tell you that everybody likes it, but people we've talked to so far have. Okay, great, thanks very much, Charlie, appreciate it. <clears throat>